All right, everybody, shalom, and welcome to the Ishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Judea. You're a part of it wherever you are. To our portion of Noah, Noah, the Ark, there's been movies made about, about it. Uh, there's been many stories. If you go to any toy, toy store, you'll get like you could get a Noah's Ark uh, type of, um, you know, a doll or toy or, or model. Uh, they have puzzles that they make out of it. You go to any kind of natural history museum. They always have uh, stuff to do with Noah's Ark. The Flood, it's a great story. There's comedy routines by Bill Cosby. Uh, everybody knows the story. It's just one of the kind of foundational stories uh, of humanity. And it's not only written in the Torah and in, in our Bible. It's also written in other uh, ancient Near East, East uh, documents and stories. And so it's just a very foundational story. And yet it's mysterious. There's so many mysterious things. There's repetitions. Uh, there's uh, the, just a question like, did God flood out the world? Um, there's the the comparative nar the, co the comparative narratives between the Gilgamesh story, for example, and others, uh, and the Torah. There's the whole uh, 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 Raven slash Dove uh, 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 saga. There's many other questions. Also, a technical question: How was uh, Noah able, if in, indeed it happened, in fact, how was he able to feed all those animals? So there's a lot of questions, uh, and and everybody loves it. It's so colorful. You know, you could you could even buy like bed sheets with with these things and there's animals coming out. There's something so imaginative about it. And yet at the same time, something not so humorous about it at all. We're talking about the destruction of the world. We're talking about God's wrath. We're talking about uh, the, the the a deluge that flooded out man and animal and insect and and birds and and, and, and everybody had to die except for one a lonely family uh, on a speck. Uh, the 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 epitome of loneliness uh, and the epitome of death that leads to rebirth and there are other questions. Uh, I love this Torah portion. I think it's it's gorgeous and 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 interesting and 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 all those questions are fun if you love Torah. And uh, I was privileged just about two years ago to sit in a class uh, of Doctor uh, Rabbi Berman uh, Joshua Berman and I got the chance to hear Chidushim understandings. Uh, in Parshat Noach, and in really an understanding of what Torah is telling me, uh, that blew my mind so much that I went back to the internet, looked for those lectures, found them, and I said, I, I have to bring him on the program if he will come on. So uh, Rabbi Dr. Joshua Berman is a professor of Tanakh at Bar Ilan University. He's a graduate of Princeton and of Yeshivat Haaretzion here, not so far in Gush Etzion. Uh, he's the author of two academic books and five books on the Torah. So he's got a lot of books underneath uh, his um, belt, including uh, one that's coming up right now, which is called Ani Mamin, uh, Biblical Criticism, Historical Truth, and the 13 Principles of Faith. We'll talk about that a little bit later. He's been published in, in all the uh, you know important magazines dealing with the Bible, and he also serves as the international on the International Advisory Board of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> and anybody who listens to my show knows that I've talked about many times how incredible, how moving uh, that uh, edifice and 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 the contents within are it's really one of the one of the wonders of the world. On top of that, uh, Rabbi Berman uh, is also now uh, taking his hand at tour guide. He is going to be taking people to Egypt and to study uh, Egypt and to see Egypt in the footsteps of the Exodus. We'll see if we could get a few words about that as well. Rabbi Berman, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Rabbi Ishai, and uh, hello to all of our <clears throat> viewers and listeners here in the Holy Land and abroad. Awesome, awesome. So um, I don't know how many people get a chance. I hope I didn't do too much volume. And first thing, let me also welcome all of my friends, uh, including Lou Weiss, uh, who helps produce the show right now. And he says, he says, looks good and sounds good. Lou, I upped my volume a little bit. Let me know if that's too much. And our good friend Erica from Sweden says, Shalom. Shalom, Eric. I missed you. Long time no speak. It's been the holidays, and it's been, uh, um, <clears throat> and I even got a little bit of a cold, so you'll have to excuse me. And it's just a regular cold, so everybody relax. Um, so it's been holidays, and, and it's been the summer, but we're back, Erica. And Evo says shalom as well. So people from all over the world uh, are coming in, and Lou says it sounds really good. So that's our, our go ahead. Dr. Berman, Dr. Rabbi Berman. I like doctor and I like rabbi, so so it's, it's, there's there's a lot of titles there. Um, rabbi. Rabbi. Let's stick with rabbi today. Um, let's talk about Parshat Noach. Um, 
first thing is, wait a minute. This this Torah portion, unlike all the other Torah portions, is a Torah portion that is found in very similar uh, language and ideas. Not totally, but but you've pointed out that there's up to 17 points of similarity between this narrative, the Torah's narrative, and the Gilgamesh narrative. Tell me a little bit about what is the Gilgamesh narrative and why would the Torah have something that's similar to, to another culture's narrative? Right. So um, the story of, of, of the flood, the, the, the Mabul, as we call it in Hebrew, <clears throat> uh, beyond the, the, what we find in Chumash, uh, we know from our study of ancient sources, particularly from uh, Mesopotamia, ancient Babylon, Assyria, places like that, that there were uh, uh, flood stories that floated around in those cultures as well. And not just the general idea that once upon a time there was a flood and there was a guy who was saved, but like with incredible details that are very similar, building a boat, bringing all the animals on board, uh, even down to when the waters began to recede, uh, the figure that appears in those uh, Mesopotamian versions of the story, they send out a raven, they send out a dove, then wow. the waters totally recede, the guy gets off, and he offers sacrifices. So that it's really very, there's a lot of similarities. So much so <clears throat> that um, many people uh, uh, will claim that the Torah seems to be familiar with this uh, uh, Mesopotamian version in something called most famously in, call, in, in the version that's found in something called the Gilgamesh epic, uh, which predates the Torah. Um, uh, and uh, the, the Torah is familiar with this, but not merely just kind of copying in a, in a, 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 in a kind of a gimmicky way or as in, in a plagiarizing way, but rather in a polemical way. And let me explain what, what, what's going on here. That this is a story that has so many copies of it so so widely distributed throughout the ancient Near East that it means that everybody knew about some version of this story. And uh, this story captured the imagination, even as it does to this very day. Rabbi Yishai, your, your whole introduction just shows, you know, people are always fascinated by this story. There's something about it that just really strikes every person across all ages as a really good story and something that makes you think. And so therefore, what the Torah is doing is saying, okay, we're going to give you our version of the story, but with some significant changes. And the significant changes aren't the number of animals or this bird or that bird. There are two really, really major differences that we find in the Torah's version of the story of the Mabul and uh, the other ancient Near Eastern versions that we find. Uh, big, huge difference, number one, is why is there a flood in the first place? When we look in these other versions, what we find is, and I, I'm not, you can't make this up, okay? What I'm telling you, it's there. You can't make this up, is that the gods uh, uh, were troubled because there were too many people on the face of the earth. And humankind was making too much noise. This is what it says. Too much noise, which was disturbing the sleep of the gods. And so therefore, the gods wanted to find a way to limit mankind, and they wound up wiping out the whole world. Okay, When we come to the Torah, now we get some, a different picture entirely. The world is destroyed not because uh, God's sleep was disturbed, because the ancients, they thought of the gods as their own selves, their own human king selves writ large. So just like kings like to have a good schluff every day, so so too the gods, the gods like to have a good schluff. When we come to the Torah, the reason that mankind suffers is because of his own misdeeds, because of his own sins, because there was evil in the world. The Torah is the only version that we know of that makes this point. Number two is that in the Mesopotamian versions, in this Gilgamesh epic, the end of the story comes to the following, that the gods realize, uh-oh, we've wiped out mankind. Who's going to build our temples? Who's going to make sacrifices for us? Okay, okay, so we're going to recreate mankind. Ah, but now we want to find a balance between having enough people to build our temples and to bring us the sacrifices, but not so many people that will have our sleep dis disturbed again. So in the Mesopotamian version, it ends with the recreation of man, but then the installation of all sorts of breaks to keep 
uh, human reproduction limited. So that means some people will be infertile. It means some babies will be born stillborn. It means some women will serve as priestesses and therefore not have relations. And all these together will keep human repro reproductivity limited. We come to the end of, of the story of the Mabel, the flood, in this week's Parsha. And it's remarkable. Noah steps foot on land, and the very first thing that Hashem says to him is, Pru urevu umilu ta'aretz. Fill, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the land. Fakert, as they say in Yiddish. 180 degrees different than what we find in the Mesopotamian version. And I would say a ringing affirmation about the value of human life. Mm -hmm. so, so what you're saying is, the Gilgamesh doctrine, first thing, it wasn't really dealing with morality. And here comes the Noah narrative, and it's dealing with human morality, and God is demanding morality. He's disappointed when we're not moral, willing to destroy the world if we're not moral. Mm -hmm. And at the end, uh, God is pleased uh, with with Noah's survival, and he says, okay, it, you know, be, 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 have fertility, fill this world, as opposed to the Gilgamesh folks who are like trying to limit human reproductivity. So, okay, so 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 according to yeah, this... Just, 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 just let me say, Rabbi Ishai, uh, uh, us being good Torah Jews, uh, uh, I should mention, these aren't my... The, what I've told you now is not my my Chiddush. It's not my original idea. And we should bring a, a Geula, redemption to the world, by saying the source of this. These ideas were, were identified by a wonderful Jewish scholar named Tikva Fremerkensky, uh, Zichron Livracha, who passed away at an untimely age. Uh, and she was a Jewish scholar. Uh, uh, and a very incisive, a very incisive uh, reader of Chumash and of ancient texts as well. I have not yeah. heard her name, and uh, mm -hmm. can you say that name again? Tikva Frimer Kensky. Well, those are those are in indeed awesome insights. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to ask a question for those people who would ask it. Kind of, I, I hear the voice out there of people saying, "So, are you saying that the Torah portion of Noah?" instead of reporting facts is a kind of social commentary on practices of the near East, understandings and narratives in the near east how is that a foundational human story to be put as the second torah portion in the in the book of bereshit which is the foundational book of of humanity's you know relationship with god so is is that what you're saying that this is like a this is like a what do you call it? Uh, you know, uh, political political comics. Is the you know is this a, is this a kind of satire or, or re understanding yeah. or, or is this? Oh, I, 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 listen, listen. Yeah, I th I think that many parts of of the Tanakh and even within Chumash uh, are polemicizing, arguing with ideologically, um, um, and often satire of well known works that were out there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Could well be this. This this is a little different. It can be that, and there can also be maybe some historical background that's actually historical fact about the Mabul. Uh, our great sages uh, 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 were not of one opinion about this. So I'll just I'll just throw out one one opinion, just so people know that it's out there. Um, uh, Rav David Svi Hoffman, who was the greatest posek, the greatest uh, halachic decisor uh, in Germany at the turn of the tw at the turn of the twentieth century. Um, and also a great master of Tanakh and of biblical criticism. He knew all this stuff. He writes in his commentary to Sefer Breshit, he says, well, it's a little hard for me to accept that there was a mobble that covered the entire world because science doesn't see that that happened. That, you know, we don't have just, you know, ge ge geological evidence of, a, of, a, of a, a flood over the whole world. So he says perhaps it was a localized flood in Mesopotamia, uh, uh, at the time, and this was a kind of a rhetoric the Torah used to say, because that was the whole world as far as the people who were living there were concerned, and so it, it describes the whole world. That's just one of them. I'm not saying right, wrong, you have to accept. I'm just, you know, it's interesting that a man with a very long beard, you know, very from, huge Talmud Chacham, uh, uh, actually said such a thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it must be pretty important for the Torah to enter in such a polemic uh, with uh, that that narrative, if it's going to put it at, at kind of you know position slot number two, um, another thing that that strikes us when we read Parshat Noach is is we have a general sense that the Torah does not waste words, is laconic, and yet there's repetitions uh, and phrases that are not you know easy to understand. For example, animals are called husband and wife, and we're not kind of used to the idea of animals that even mate being understood as husband and wife. And other things within, within 
um, within that Torah portion that is hard for us to to kind of it, it's unusual. There's a structure there that's unusual, and your research has shown that, that there's a very clear structure underneath it all. I wanted to ask you, like, what what's with the weird structure in Parshat Noah? Okay, let, let me let me uh, give a, a kind of an overall methodological point that's raised by the Ralbag of all people, one of our medieval uh, classical uh, uh, exegetes of the Torah, um, um, and it's it's a really really important point, not just for for the story of the Mabul of the flood, but just generally. Uh, the Ralbag or of Levi Ben Gershon, who lived in the 14th century uh, in Provence in, in France, uh, he writes at the end of his commentary to Sefer Shmot. He entertains the famous question at the end of Sefer Shmot that uh, the parshiot of the Mishkan uh, seem to be repeated just you know the, in all their detail twice. We have the giving of the of the of the commandments of the of the Mishkan, uh, the tabernacle, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the tabernacle, and of the the priestly garments uh, over several chapters at the end of Exodus, and then after. The, the story of the golden half, we have the story of the actual execution of all these details. Right. It's so it's like follow. it's like do this, and then it's like, and they did this. And it was like the do this and the did oh, this it's, are it's mirrors. More like do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. And then but Salah went and he did A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J in all their details. That's exactly what right. there is. And the Al Bag says, you know, I'm really bothered by this. He says, because where I live today in France in the 14th century, we believe that, that a, a work of literature that is perfect is a work, as you said, Rabbi Yishai, uh, a work that has nothing superfluous, where every word has meaning um, and, and significance that, that, that should be evident to the, to, to, to the human eye. And the Rabag says, you know, I don't know, it doesn't seem like the Torah really needed to go into all this detail the second time. Just say, right. that Petzalo did everything that Moshe Rabbeinu or that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had commanded him. And the Rabag says that he looked hither and yon at all, this is a famous question, anybody who's learned Sefer Shmot has probably uh, uh, encountered this question. And the Rabag says, I looked everywhere and I never found an answer that I liked. And then he says, so it must be that at the time that the Torah was written, this was the accepted literary style. Vahanavi yedaber lefi haminhag. And the prophet, which in this case is Moshe Rabbeinu, will always speak according to the conventions of the time. And that's so fascinating. It shows such humility on his part that just because something isn't clear to me today in 2021 or in the 1400s, doesn't mean that it wasn't clear to a previous age. We have a very limited view of reality. We think we see the whole picture, especially right. us. We have Google. We have everything. We can see farther and bigger and wider than anyone before us. And I wonder whether really it's the opposite is true. But we see. We're so influenced. We don't even know what we don't see. Uh, and, the, and the amazing thing is that the Rabag was spot on that we find in so many ancient uh, compositions exactly just what we said before, a king will instruct his servant, go and do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then the narrative will say, the servant went and he did A, and then he did B and C and D and, and, and all the detail. The reason it's that way, by the way, is because uh, when, you, when you write things that way, it makes it a little wordy, but it makes it easier to remember, to put into memory. And they were memorizing all of these compositions. And that's why they did it that way. Uh, and so I think the it's memory, but but I would I would also throw out to you that it's not just memory. There's something, um, there there's 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 a kind of perfection in okay. in Perhaps. for example okay. God saying I'm laying out to you what I want you to do, and then you do it, mm -hmm. and and you kind of the text proves that they yeah. did it. There's a fulfillment. There's something kind of more whole. It's like another side very of the pyramid. about it. That's true. Right. That's true. But I'm right. saying that this is something that's really quite common. Okay, even when right. it's not God's talking. Okay. When it's any figure of authority or hierarchical stature, okay. Now here, here in in the story of the Mabul, the Mabul, I would say, even relative to the rest of Chumash, is uncharacteristically just, just to uh, translate Mabul as the flood, the oh, deluge. Flood, oh, okay, yeah, I'll speak in it. We yeah. have we have also folks from all over the world, Doctor. Right? So, they're all welcome, and they're all they're all dear to us. Okay, I was that's right. To that's you. right. In, yeah. in, including including, uh, just let me say hi to my friend Desmond. Uh, yeah. who says shalom 
and my all friend of our Alice, brothers of Shalom. Jewish and Christian faith. Yes, uh, and, and all kinds faith. of others. And, and others. Faith. We have okay. we have folks here from all over the world. Uh, uh, Jay White says, "Amen." Chodesh Tov, gentlemen. Have a great rest of the week. May Mashiach be revealed in public anytime now. And a warm Shabbat Shalom to both of you and your families. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and uh, who else we have here? We have. Uh, uh, we don't, we don't, I, the Christian stuff is not something I read. Uh, and then he, Lou, my good friend and co-producer here says, wasn't the first part of the Mishkan's instructions and the repeat, the actual construction? Yes, Lou. Yes. That's exactly what, sure. what Rabbi Berman's saying. He's saying, but it didn't need to do that. It could have just said, and they did it and that's it. Uh, and, and, you know, and Batsalo did it. But the question is why, why this, a uh, full description of what is requested and then what is done, what it could have been shortened. And then you could say, you see, the Torah is very laconic. It's very t tight on words. And, and Rabbi Berman is saying that is the, uh, um, on, that is the, the, the way that things were written back then. That's how people understood it as normal back then. And there's many other literature in the near East that, that mirrors that, that way of writing. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now here, as I began to say in the story of the flood, uh, the, the story of the flood is, is, I would say, uncharacteristically really messy. Messy in the sense that there's a lot of repetition, and it's very difficult to plot a kind of a chronology as you work through the 77 verses of this story. It's, it's right. You cannot read it and say, well, verse 2 follows chronologically. What, what, what is described in verse 2 chronologically follows what's described in verse 1, and, 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 and so on and so forth. You'll see it can't work. Things seem to be jumping back and forth. So let me just say that when we have a natural expectation that a story will simply proceed in chronological order, one event after another, uh, that which all probably everyone listening or watching this this uh, 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 this discussion will say, yeah, well, that's just that's just obvious. That's just natural. I will tell you, friends, that that was not obvious or natural to ancient writers. This was very natural and obvious to Aristotle. And when and Aristotle wrote a book about what's called poetics, and all of us, all of our natural senses of what makes good sense in terms of literature, stem from him. And so if, even if you've never read Aristotle, if you were speaking English, if you were raised in the Western world, the air you breathe and the thoughts you think without even knowing it all come from Aristotle. But hmm. the Torah was not written by Aristotle, okay? And nobody who was reading the Torah in the time of, 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 of Tanakh knew anything from Aristotle. But they knew about other literary conventions, other ways of writing from the ancient world. And I want to show now uh, one convention, one kind of way of writing things that we know is very common and, and explains, I think, the, the, what looks to us as un, the unevenness of the story of the, of the deluge, of the Mabul, and suddenly, poof, everything looks different. So, Rabbi Yishai, I'm going to try to share now our screen, okay? Okay, let's play the share game. We'll do our best okay. here. Okay, here we go. One minute. Stay tuned, everybody. And uh, in the meantime, while, while uh, Rabbi Berman prepares it, just want to say hi to everybody out there. It's so fun to be live with you again here on the Ishai Fleischer Show. We have uh, our rabbi, Dr. Berman, with us, and he is the author of many books, uh, including the uh, upcoming, or it's actually it's already available on Amazon, Ani Mamin, Biblical Criticism, Historical Truth, and the 13 Principles of Faith. So check that out. Uh, it's easy to, to buy right now on, um, on Amazon. And also he's going to be taking people on tour to Egypt. And uh, that's going to be through Kesher Tours. And this is not just a tour uh, to uh, to shoot the rapids, to shoot the cataracts uh, on the Nile, but rather it is in the footsteps of the Exodus. So you're going to see uh, Moses in the uh, in the reeds. You're going to see the splitting so of the Red Sea. You're stuff, gonna... So much stuff in Egypt that just illuminates the Torah incredibly, especially the story of the, of the Exodus and especially the construction of the tabernacle. So it'll be the first time, what? it'll be the first trip to Egypt, an organized trip that's kosher, that uh, that has the aim of looking at these great sites in Egypt through the eyes of the Bible. And the I think that sounds that. great. I yeah. think that sounds great. It's it's a commitment of both time and money. It, it is a 10-day yep, tour. Is that correct? Yes, it is. That's right, in January. Right. And the, the, the details are at Kesher Tours, Kesher with a K. K, like kosher, but with an E, Kesher. Kesher right, Tours. Right. You can find it all there. 
That's right. I have okay. it up here. Uh, you can see Kesher Tours. Uh, and I think Lou should uh, should uh, should head out to Egypt with you. And I already sent the link to my mom. Uh, but Lou says, is the book available at Pomerantz? Because that's, yes, that's where is. he gets the Yes, books. absolutely. Pomerantz is a good friend of mine. And he's a child. And uh, uh, yes, yes, has my book. Yeah. As I recall, Mr. Pomerantz also needs our prayers for Fuash Lema. Oh, yeah. Oh, still. Okay. Wow. Okay. That's right. I think yes. it's Michael, I mean, right? I think I mean, it's Michael, and, and, yes, and he should yes. be blessed and, and, and yeah. uh, have a Fuash Lema. Yeah. Uh, very yeah. good. Let me get back here to banners. Fine. And I see now that you have sent up. Okay. <laughs> Excuse let, me. Let, let, let me explain what this is. You can see it clearly, uh, Ravishai. Yes, I could see it clearly enough. Anyway, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Okay, part of it. Okay. All right. Let me, what I've done here, okay, uh, is um, I've taken uh, the verses or, or yeah, the verses of the story of the deluge, and I've laid them out in a certain way. So here, for example, the first, the first, the, or the first psukim, the first verses of the story of the deluge, we have Elohim, God, pledges to Noah to destroy all flesh. And then there's mention of flood to destroy uh, uh, all flesh. And then God says that uh, he's going to make a covenant to sustain Noah and his animals. And I'm just kind of following the order of the verses. Now, I've set this up. You can see clearly in a certain way. What happens here is this. This is something called a chiastic structure. Very common in the ancient world. What is a chiastic structure? It's where you have a composition. In this case, the story of the deluge, the Mabul. And what happens is that the first verse or the first few verses make mention of something. And that element, what I've called here element A, Elohim or Elohim, God pledges to Noah to destroy all flesh. That will be repeated. The first element will have a mirror to it in the final element, the last pasuk, the last verse of the story. Elohim pledges to Noah to preserve all flesh. It's the opposite, mm -hmm. right? In other words, the, the, the first verse, Hashem pledged to Noah to destroy all flesh, kol basar, that's the word that's there. And the last pasuk, the last verse, whoop, whoops, just get that back, yeah. The last verse, Hashem pledges to preserve Kol Basar. That's right here. Okay. Now, can we do can we do another example of that throughout the uh, like before we get to the the center one, like another like glaring example of uh, the chiastic structure sure. okay. of okay. relationship? Okay. So, right. Okay. So that, that's kind of that's kind of uh, that's kind of general that one. So, for right. example, um, how about this? Uh, um, uh, we have here. Uh, uh, the H element, seven days of waiting for the flood, okay? And the parallel one in the second half, seven days for the waters to subside. Mm -hmm. uh, or pretty good. Um, once the mountains are covered and the mountains are covered, then the Torah says that for 150 days, the waters prevailed, okay? Then parallel to the O, oh, the 150 days that the waters prevailed, we have 150 days the waters abated, okay? Mm -hmm. And if N was the mountains were covered, then N prime is the mountain tops were visible, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and on and on. Um, uh, for example, the K one, the Torah says that once Noah entered the, the, uh, the ark, that Hashem shut him in, like Hashem kind of, as it were, uh, shut the hatch, okay? Uh, on 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 the ark that's k and then what we have here the parallel in terms of the order of the verses is that noah opens the window mm -hmm. of the ark okay opening up the uh the hatch okay now now what's so interesting about this is that you skip almost nothing when you set it up this way and what's so fascinating is what is at the center the very center what's at the very center is chapter verse one which says, Hashem remembered Noah and everything that was in the Teva, meaning this is the inflection point. This is where everything flips. Everything until chapter 8, verse 1, was destruction, marble, deluge. Everything following chapter 8, verse 1, 
is recreation of the world, okay? Um, and so it's exactly at the center. And I'll, I'll say something uh, further. Uh, I have a, a good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Ronnie Benham of Flatbush, New York, who discovered the following thing. When you look at the entire story of the, of the deluge from here, from where it starts until where it ends, it's 77 verses long, okay? And the inflection point, this, this verse, chapter 8, verse 1, of those 77 verses, it is the 39th verse, okay? That is to say, it's exactly at the center, okay? There are, there are uh, 38 verses before and 38 verses afterwards, and this is exactly wow. in the center. So it's in the center in terms of the number of, of verses in the whole story, and thematically, when you lay out what's happening in every two or three verses, it also happens to be at the center. So the idea here of whoops, I'm sorry, of chiastic structure is that you know if we sometimes think, well, the most important part of a story is the end. You know, what's the bottom line? What was the finale? You know, what was the last scene in the movie? Uh, in in ancient writing, sometimes it was what was the middle point of the story? That's mm. where everything turns. And okay, so I got to I got to stop you for a second. I got to stop you for a second. Yeah. Um, I put up a good friend of mine and who's a real intellectual. My friend Nachum wrote the uh, the word, which was an onomatopoeia. He wrote "wow," and and the reason I put up the "wow" is because when I saw this uh, you, two years ago, my reaction was "wow." For a person who loves Torah and knows that 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 it's godly and wants to understand this this strange and and when i say strange i mean that in a in a in a in a complimentary way that's a strange and an interesting torah portion mm -hmm. um and when you when you show this chiastic structure of the whole torah portion and how it it matches up and and how it's you know the, and this middle point this inflection point of that hashem remembered uh, noah I, I i don't know for me it was like a you know, it, it was it was a wow. It was an aha wow moment. It, it was just like yes, uh, like 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 something you know opened up, and I understood it better. And uh, just today, as I was uh, reading the Torah portion and preparing for my podcast, um, I focused in on on that very like I understood now what the what what the what the what the big point of the whole Torah portion was, which is that Hashem remembered Noah. We read it, of course, in Rosh Hashanah as well, uh, and and and. Then also, what, what's what's so, and and you could you could find a way out of it. But if you are looking for it, the beauty of the and the order of the Creator in this story, and and the purposefulness, and of course you use this as also an answer to the uh, biblical critics, who I may call scoffers. Uh, maybe you wouldn't use that term, but I would, uh, and you use it to great extent as an answer to the folks who say this is written by multiple authors and there's all kinds of interlacing authors in this whole thing and that's why it's good jumping back and forth and suddenly you see the the chiastic structure you're like you're like exactly like Nahum says you're like wow and and the the unity the brilliance the beauty and the message uh come out very clearly through this so i i really needed to stop you and point that out so go ahead all right okay but I want to show something that that, that 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 to me is 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 even more wow. Okay. Okay. All right, Rabbi Yishai. Okay. Okay. I'll um, I'll put on a seatbelt. I'm I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. All right. Uh, let me start with a, a comment that that the Ramban Nachmanides. Okay, 13th century tremendous uh, uh, Torah sage in all areas of Torah, and who wrote a very influential commentary on Chumash on 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 the Pentateuch. He says. The, on this verse, God remembers Noah. That Hashem remembered everything, remembered Noah and all that all that was living inside the the ark. The, the Ramban says that at this moment, uh, which as I've already noted, you know, from here the news is all, until here the news is all bad, and from here the news is all good. Uh, the Ramban says that that. The, the Almighty, at this moment of chapter 8, verse 1, um, it, it, it occurred to him at this moment that he desired to recreate the world. 
And, you know, you can see what that, you know, that, that, that seems to make sense. Yeah, you know, the world is being put back together. It's becoming habitable again, habitable again for human beings. Now, with that in mind, that this, that this verse begins a process of recreating the world, well, let's look at this table, okay? When we go through Perichet chapter 8 and 9, which are the part of the story there's all good news, you know, the world coming back together. What you can see is that sequentially every step of that process follows in order steps that happened in the account of creation in Genesis 1. So that, for example, if we have here uh, in chapter 8, it says, ruach Hashem, the Almighty, passed a wind over the water. Well, on day one of creation, it says that the divine wind was passing over the water. And uh, 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 if we had in day two of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the account of creation, a separation of the waters of the higher and lower firmaments, here in the account of recreation, the Torah says that Hashem blocked the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky, also separating out big bodies of water. Day three, the first thing in Maaseh Breshit, the appearance of dry land, and here in chapter eight, the appearance of mountain peaks, near Uroshi Harim, right? Passive voice, just like here, Vatera is passive, near U is passive. Uh, day three, second part of day three, is the day on which vegetation is created. And the next thing that happens here is that the dove returns with an olive branch. That's a sign that the world now has vegetation. Next thing that happens is that uh, on day four of creation, Hashem creates the sun and the moon to distinguish between day and night. The Torah tells us that the dove returned le'et erev, at evening time. Well, what is evening? Evening is a mix of day and night. In other words, there's notions now of day and night. Day five of creation, Hashem creates the birds. The next step of Perakhet, the dove, the Yonah, leaves the Teva, the ark, and doesn't come back. That is to say, it enters the new world and stays there. It's like birds are being recreated. Day six, creation of animals and man. The next thing that happens in chapter eight is the disembarkment of Noah and the animals. They too take their place in the new world, back on earth. Um, uh, there's a command in, in, in Maaseh Breshi to, to Adam Arishon, to uh, uh, the first man, to Adam, to be fruitful and multiply, and that he's going to have sustenance, lachem yele ochla, those words in Hebrew, and the same thing, Noah is told, be fruitful and multiply, and he's told about the things that will be lachem yele ochla, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this shows, you know, even greater purpose of what's going on here, and it shows that what the Ramban says Ed is really correct, down to a level of detail that I, I don't know if, if, if even the Ramban noticed it, but it seems to be very, very clear and deliberate. Um, so I think, you know, this, these are kind of ways of looking for patterns that, you know, aren't so uh, natural for us today. Um, even in the Middle Ages, I, I'm not a familiar with any of the classical Torah giants that, that identified this, but in every age, people have their own different literary sensitivities. And thank God today we're able to kind of reclaim and recapture some of what was going on in the time of the Torah. Okay, so so gonna... Lou Weiss uh, leaves a message and he says, wow, number two. That's right. That is a wow number okay. two. Okay. I'm glad, I'm glad Lou shares my excitement about this. That's yes. right. And it is exciting. It is exciting. And it gives us, uh, it gives us a real uh, sense of, of first thing, first thing, if, if you, if you will it, if, if you want to see it, it is uh, mm -hmm. clear that the hand of God is here. This is written by a master author, uh, a, mm -hmm. a master editor. Uh, and, and the other aspect of it is um, now we understand the Noah story. Like, really, God destroyed the world and wanted to rebuild it. And he took it step by step and rebuilt the world and gave it a second chance. It gave it a second chance, uh, gave it a rebirth. That's very powerful stuff. Um, yeah, th th this is this is why I wanted to bring you on. I wanted to talk about Parashat Noah and give people a, give people a sense uh, of all that, and yet there are still awesome questions lingering. What are these two different birds? And 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 then, of course, the whole issue of the Tower of Bavel and 
those of us who were in, in New York City on, on, on the September 11th, 2001, you know, saw these great towers fall. And, and I remember thinking, my, my God, like, can I learn something from, uh, and this was around the same time uh, of, uh, of uh, wow. the, the, the story right. of the Tower of Bavel. We, we felt it very powerfully then. Boy, was that a physically powerful experience. Wow, wow. It's almost un, uh, undescribable. But it was, you know, that literary thing, that the Torah thing that we had just read uh, came back to us. Uh, so that's uh, that's an awesome experience that you've given us. I want to really thank you for that, uh, uh, Rabbi Berman. Uh, and I want to ask you about uh, what you're coming up and uh, what you're going to be doing very soon in January. You're going to be taking people to Egypt uh, to have these kind of experiences with you on the ground uh, in Egypt's land. Hey, isn't there a problem of going back to Egypt? Uh, is that is that is that a is that a halachic challenge or 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 what? Not that I know of. I mean, I don't. You know, we're not going to buy horses. So I don't think that there's a problem with that. And uh, right, yeah. yeah, we're not going to be sent back. So tell us a little bit about what's going to be on your trip there uh, in Egypt. Right. So you know, friends, just like I, I, I hope that uh, that all of you shared in the excitement that I have every time that I that I read or teach or teach this material. Uh, that wow, you know, who would have thought? You know, these these ancient ways of thinking, these parallels. That we we didn't really know about that suddenly things just come alive in three dimension and in multicolor, uh, and the same thing happens when you visit Egypt. Um, uh, the the type of polemicizing that I discussed earlier, how the Torah is taking a story that was well known about the about the deluge and it redoes it and it tells it in a different way, and you only understand you only appreciate that if you know the original that that, that it's arguing with. Well. Friends, this happens with the story of the Exodus too. It turns out that the story of the Exodus in Sefer Shemot, as we have it, is also polemicizing with inscriptions that you can go and see in Egypt. And you can see pictures of, of uh, that, that are remarkably similar to the Mishkan and understand why the Mishkan looks like some of the things that you're looking at. And it's all from the right time period. And of course, the Mishkan is taking place against the backdrop of the Exodus from Egypt it's just mind blowing stuff. It's mind blowing right. stuff. Um, uh, my uh, mom, my mom, who's visited Egypt twice, told me many times. She no, said to me, no, "If you want to understand the Mishkan, go down to Egypt, and you'll oh understand, you know, many pieces of the Mishkan." That's exactly oh, what she told me. Yeah, mom. Wow. Gee, that's absolutely. Cool. Yeah, right. that's doctor mom. Okay, that's a doctor mom. It's a serious mom. Dr. I got mom. there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And you also have your, your book that's already out right now, which is called Ani Mamin, Biblical Criticism, Historical Truth, and 13 Principles of right. Faith. Everything, about we, everything we did here today is, uh, is in that book. Uh, and just generally the types of questions that people, some people have uh, once they're exposed to this stuff called biblical criticism, you know, uh, uh, was there an exodus? Do we have to believe that everything in the Torah uh, is factually true? Uh, how do we deal with repetitions and sometimes contradictions in stories, contradictions in the Torah's laws, um, and much, much more? So I, I try to I try to approach all of that from an academic uh, standpoint in a way which I think is also uh, 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 true to our to our traditions as well. Right. I guess I guess you're you're exactly like uh, like the Torah itself. On the one hand, polemical. Well, I, I don't know about yeah. that, but okay. yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> right. On the one hand, polemical. On the other hand, uh, you know, on the, the the doctor side, and then there's the uh, the rabbi side, the Torah side, okay. and okay. both of those coexist. Uh, okay. Mark Pickles, a good friend of mine and a great writer himself, writes. Wow. Thank thank you both. Enlightening and inspiring insights. Mark is from England, uh, and D Alberti asks. Will the tour be given in English? I'm guessing. Oh it's yeah, in English yeah, language. I should have said that. Yes, this is for for English speakers. Yes, yes. Right, because you also do teach in Hebrew, right? Am, sure, am, I, of am I right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we do in, in Israel. We also teach in Hebrew. Absolutely. So thank mm -hmm. you, D. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Lou, and uh, thank you, Rabbi Dr. Joshua Berman, who is a professor at Tanakh, uh, Tanakh the Bible at Bar Ilan University, graduated at, uh, at Princeton and Yeshiva Haaretzion, author of five books and many articles uh, on the advisory board uh, of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., a highly recommended place to visit if you're there. Uh, we talked about the new book on Imamin and the tour to Egypt. Awesome stuff. And uh, we talked about Parshat Noach. We opened up a Tzohar. We opened up a, ah, a, window, a window, as we learned, right? A window into, in a, nice into understanding. Put. That's right. Nice Very good. Put. Nice put. Rabbi Berman, thank you so much for joining us, and God bless you. Rabbi Yishai, thank you, and thank you all the listeners and viewers. Shalom, shalom. All right, everybody, God bless you, and thank you so much for being with me. Lots of blessings from the land of Israel, where Torah comes to life, where Torah comes to life, and where 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 something that, that you just didn't, didn't know five minutes before becomes 
you know, a, you become aware of it, you understand it, and suddenly, wow, Hashem has sh shown a light upon you, and there's a knowledge in your mind. You're like, this is one amazing Torah portion. And if you, uh, like Mark and Lou and, and Nachum, stayed along and, and, and learned and understood that, you'll never look at Parshat Noach again. And that's a blessing, and that's a big schut for me to be able to bring that to you and to bring uh, Rabbi Berman to you today. What a schut it is to, to learn our Torah and to send it forth from Zion. Uh, Catherine says... Thank you, rabbis. Always learn something new and inspiring on Rabbi Ishai's programs. It's a big schut. God bless you, folks. More great stuff is on the way. Thank you, Lou, for producing the show. Thank you to my wife for making me tea and taking care of me here. And uh, lots of love and blessings from the land of blessings. And shalom.